Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Today's text uh, are for April 6th, which is Maundy Thursday. Our readings uh, for year A or for, uh, for Maundy Thursday are um, Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, and then 11 through 14. Or you can just read uh, verses 1 through 14 in chapter 12 of Exodus. The psalm is 116, verses 1 and 2, and then 12 through 19. The second reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. And our gospel is John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. And then there's the skip over to 31b through verses 35. But Caroline might want to help us get into this. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we have four really different texts, right, in terms of potential foci for the evening. And we all know that certain rituals uh, and traditions are usually the dominant reality for Monday, Thursday and Good Friday and and perhaps less uh, less carried by the texts. But I I'll start with John and and this I'm not believe me I'm not suggesting foot washing because uh, because of perhaps the what I'll I, I will say but it for me this text is so it's a it's a critical text for this evening because it it has the potential the homiletical potential to put everybody who is at that service there mm-hmm. on that night and and not as a not as a moment to listen to Jesus and to uh, to hear how Jesus is passing down a ritual or to say, do this in remembrance of me, but to put us in that night and what, what the disciples experienced and what Jesus experienced that evening. Mm-hmm. And, and so that it's less about explaining the text and more about what would this night have been like. And so for John, it, I am going to suggest you don't have to add the verses, but for the preacher to really pay attention to the fact that 13, one uh, through the end of the chapter is, is are absolutely essential for what this, what this night means for Jesus and his disciples. Because if you just, if you skip over 18 to 30, you miss the betrayal of, of Judas. And if you don't keep reading after the love commandment, you don't get foretelling of Peter's denial. And it really skews the love commandment that the love commandment becomes, see how I washed your feet. Now go do that. Mm-hmm. When you have, when you eliminate the betrayal and the denial, that the betrayal and the denial are what surround the love, that love means loving the person who will betray you and loving the person who will deny you. And uh, so there's a corrective there, but also in 21 through 30, we get this, we have Jesus was really troubled in spirit and says, one of you will betray me. And when you read through that narrative, it's, you have the disciples like looking at each other, like, who is it? Who could it be? You know, and we, we would so easily, we so easily say, well, it's Judas and that's what Judas did. But the narrative doesn't let you do that because Judas's betrayal is not when he goes to the garden. Jesus hands himself on, over in the garden. The betrayal in John is to abandon the relationship with Jesus, to walk out, to go in, into the dark side and immediately went out and he was night. That is the potential for every single one of us. And that's why the disciples are looking around the table saying, is it, is it you? Is it you? Is it me? Could it be me? And, and then why Peter's denial is so important because he then later will deny his own discipleship. So it, it, it puts us all there and, 
Uh, and and the contrast of what of Judas walking out of this relationship, that's what betrayal means. It doesn't mean to hand Jesus over. Jesus will do that himself, but it's to it's to it's it's to leave the relationship. It's to abandon the relationship mm-hmm. and to say, I don't want that anymore, or I don't mm-hmm. and the relationship that you are abandoning is 1323. The beloved disciple, whom the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining on the breast or chest or bosom of Jesus. That's what you're leaving behind. Mm-hmm. And so that's the poignancy of this evening, according to John, is uh is it's it's not focused on the meal. That's uh because the meal is John 6 and John 21. It's focused on this, the reality of the relationship that is possible in 1323. And yet, uh, and yet we, we walk away from that. Yeah. And, uh, and how is it that we are all sitting around that table and what would we do? Um, so that's, that's where I'm at. Well, wow, that's powerful. That's powerful. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> You know, the commandment is the, the, the commandment is so important, and I, and I think sometimes gets overshadowed if if this text is turned to just for uh, the basis for a foot washing ceremony. And so, right. to talk about that that love commandment, which is of course not a new commandment, uh, it's it, it it appears to be the heart of the of the Torah as well, but. It, new in the sense that I think of how it's going to be lived out or how it's going to be understood or how it now gets lived out in light of the cross, which Jesus will also say in John is an act of love on his part, which is somewhat paradoxical as well. But I think just to, to talk about that, this is, this is the church's, in John's gospel at least, that the, his followers are receiving their mission, right? In chapters 13 through 17. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, this kicks it off. It kicks it off with a with a liturgy of sorts, or with an embodied expression, but also this commandment. What's this love going to look like? How are you going to be empowered to live out this love? What are the benefits of this love for yourself and your relationship with God? Mm-hmm. Always a good thing for a church to revisit what its mission is all about, right? What its purpose is. And, and so what does this look like beyond, like you said, Caroline, just condescension or just doing a nice thing or or, or taking on the role of a of a lesser or of a servant for the sake right. of something, and I I think that that's important, Matt, because uh, f- for two reasons. One is that as you as you mentioned, this is setting in motion the rest of the farewell discourse, where Jesus will say, "No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends," and so the love to which Jesus is is asking or what the the kind of love that Jesus is asking is the love that he is going to embody and so and the and so to read through to read through the farewell discourse and then look back and say you know love one another as i have loved you <laughs> is really puts a a, con- a really critical context and basis for what this love looks like the other thing i'll say is that in that Jesus is also, Jesus has just demonstrated love one another as I have loved you with Mary. Mary mm-hmm. loves him with that abundance of, of perfume, that anointing. And to what extent he takes that expression of love, that embodiment of love into this moment. And there's all kinds of verbal connections and vocabulary connections, but that, that, extraordinary expression of abundant love that he received, how is it that now he can do that for his followers, even his betrayer and his denier? Mm-hmm. And so that's when, when, when Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you, he's just done it with Mary. And uh, so he's not just making stuff up. This is, <laughs> this is, you know, this is what he's already experienced and, and then this is what he has in mind in that love commandment. He probably still smells like it too. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That smells pretty good. It wasn't yeah. that long ago. Yeah. It's not, not like he's showering every day, but yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. Just the yeah, previous very chapter. Much, very much so. Very much so. You know, um, one of the things that um, 
one of the things that when we teach preaching, uh, Caroline knows, I, I talk about the role of the, the pastor or the preacher, and it's a role of pastor, uh, which is the caregiver in the community. It's the role of priest, which is the one that um, makes sure that the c- community continues its practices like the sacraments. Um, and it's the role of prophet, which is a truth teller, not uh, the fortune teller. And um, there's a sense in which if this service is simply an opportunity for us to do something and we never take the time to teach this story in its context, as Caroline just laid out, it's, it's, you know, it's two chapters. It's a lot of scenes here. Um, but when else are we going to know this story? We know the story of Christmas because we spend time telling it, you know, um, and we know the story of Easter of the resurrection because we spend time telling it. This is an opportunity for us to spend time telling how all of this pulls together. And so there are a lot of details. When else will your congregation learn this story uh, so that they can put it, you put all of these wonderful principles and practices into context. And again, supporting what you were saying, Caroline, in terms of the the, the foot washing exercise or event, um, if we feel we've satisfied our quota by doing a foot washing on Maudie Thursday or at a retreat, which I've experienced as incredibly powerful, we miss the opportunity to embody it in the places where it's really needed. Um, a few years ago, uh, I had the opportunity to go to um, uh, to um, Israel, uh, uh, to Egypt, and I may have shared this on on a previous podcast, but um, there is, uh, and I can't call her name right now, but there is uh, today a Catholic nun who is doing in Egypt what um, Mother Teresa did in in, uh, Calcutta. And um, one of the things that as a result of this ministry in Egypt is bringing together all of these children, uh, basically, it, I'm going to be a little shorthanded here and say it's kind of providing a little nursery school for them. So they they come together, they have meals, they play games, they learn the story and love of Jesus, but they learn it by experiencing it. And this is this is the scene I want to paint. All of these children come in, obviously from a poverty that we don't know in much of the United States. And they walk through these horribly filthy roads, barefoot or in sandals. And they come into uh, this school, this building. And the first thing that is done is their feet are washed. Mm -hmm. And their feet that need to be washed. This is not symbolic. This is a necessity. And doing that every day for these children is their work. It's not a ceremony. It's not something that's done on a retreat or on once a year. It's done because they know the story of John 18 and 19 and the life of Christ. And so our foot washing shouldn't be a service. I, I, I would prophetically push to say this truth. It should be feeding the hungry it should be making sure that the homeless have a plate, a roof over their head. It should be making sure that someone who's abused is safe. I could go on, but you've let me say a lot more than time should have allowed. Don't Thanks laugh at that. We should probably Don't move on to uh, maybe the Exodus and First Corinthians for people who are going the different route. Right, right. Uh, uh, it's my voice going to be on the, uh, on, on the Exodus one. And, and what I want to lift up on this one again, uh, uh, again, the story, um, which would be, you know, paying attention to the whole chapter and, and, and just reading what this 
invitation to ceremony, this invitation to memorial services, this invitation to festivals and rituals. And this one in particular, which is the cornerstone story um, for ancient Israel. And uh, what I want to lift up for folks, and I hope Caroline and Matt, that you will you will say something more behind this, but I've already said a lot. So I just want to throw this out there, is that paying attention to the text of Exodus is not for us to put it as a parallel from the Passover to uh, 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 from uh, the Last Supper back to uh, the Jewish Seder and, and, the, and the first Passover, but it's to recognize the very differences of these practices of ancient Israel, of contemporary Jews, and of present day Christians. And, and um, we can't know the difference if we don't know the details of the story. And what we try to do is conflate it. And again, in that kind of truth telling word, I would challenge us to understand the differences and not just conflate it and make it an easy way for us to do something we enjoy. Yeah, yeah that's so important. Thanks for that. Um, right, this text becomes a basis for Jesus to reinterpret something new in the Last Supper, just like the later rabbinic period develops Seder rituals to try to embody that. For, if, so many ways branch out from that Exodus narrative. Can I say something about First Corinthians before we uh, before we move no. on? Or before we well, Caroline, no, Caroline, to... Caroline's one wagging thing... her finger at me. Well, no, one thing about the Exodus text is uh, yes, the way in which Jesus uh, Jesus revisits this text in in his own you know in in the own sense of what the Passover means for John. If you're sticking with John, just to remind our listeners that uh, the that the chronology of Jesus' death in John is different, so that Jesus dies on the same day that the Passover lambs would have been slaughtered, and so this text becomes a really important text for John in recognizing, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, not sins, but sin, takes away that separation from God, and so uh, a, a preacher might want to go in that direction as well in considering the Exodus text through the Johannine use of it and not um, not the Pauline or uh, synoptic use of it. Okay, that's it. No, really important mm -hmm. stuff, right? And and to see that that Passover lamb is uh, not, a, not a sacrifice in terms of how temple sacrifice is understood as well or a sin offering, but as something quite different. But, Right, right. I'm sure we'll get back to that on our Good Friday podcast. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. First Corinthians 11. Yeah, I think it's important with this to to zero in on the context, or at least to be aware. Like Paul doesn't say, you know, you're now in week eight of confirmation. It's time to learn the words of institution. But he's writing this to a Corinthian church that he thinks is defiling the supper because of the way in which they are importing into their celebration certain hierarchies, certain aspects of privilege that the culture grants them that is normal in, at an everyday dinner party in their culture. But Paul says there's something wrong with that. And so that's why I don't miss verses, verse 26, which is not something that Jesus says, but is part of what Paul says to the Corinthians and has now made it into a lot of communion liturgies. Mm -hmm. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Mm -hmm. Part of what he's getting at is the ritual itself proclaims something about the meaning of the death of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so the how is just as important as the what. So many people look at this and think, what? What are the right words to say? What's the right theology that comes out of this? Paul is deeply concerned about the how. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are you going to celebrate this meal? If you celebrate in a meal that reinforces hierarchy that tells people they're of greater or lesser value than somebody else in the room. Not only are you doing it wrong, you're defiling the meal, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? You're making a, a mockery, a disgrace of the crucifixion itself. That's why he's so, well, there's an intensity that's not mm -hmm. in this text, but around it. Around it. And so to think a bit about that with people, that part of what this meal is about is not just ingesting Christ, again, however your tradition wants to talk about that, 
but it's meant to be an act of love with everybody else in the room and everybody else who's invited in and shares at this at this banquet. And so uh, I would urge people not to see this as, quote unquote, the founding of or the initiation of, of, of a sacrament as much as how do we show love in the ways we gather, in the ways we try to lift up the cross in our in our ritual and our everyday life together. And attending to that means that we pay attention to the difference in the practice of the way it was in Exodus, the way it is in John, the way it is in, in Paul, in the sense that it's not just a quickie in the midst of a service. This is a real dinner that took time and um, um, I just, just wonder if we could recover every meal as an opportunity to recognize our neighbor as equal and the death, uh, proclaiming the death of Jesus until he comes.